So this is the third video of the AP Biology Unit 2 series. Unit 2 covers cell structure and function, and this video is going to cover membrane transport and facilitated diffusion, which is 2.6 and 2.7 of AP Biology. So some important terms in this section are passive and active. So first of all, what do those terms mean in general, not as they apply to biology, and then how do they apply to biology? How do they apply to molecules? So in both cases, both in general and as they apply to molecules, passive versus active is all about energy. Passive does not require an input of energy, whereas active does. Let's look at what that means with molecules. So diffusion is passive transport. To understand diffusion, you need to know what a concentration gradient is. So see if you can define what is a concentration gradient, what is diffusion, and then connect those concepts to um, the idea of active versus passive transport. Why is diffusion passive transport? So a concentration gradient is where you have um, the concentration or the amount of particles per volume is higher in one area than another. Sometimes that's just areas of one fluid, like you could see in this dropper, where when you first put in the concentrated dye, that has a high concentration of dye molecules, and um, they move to areas where there's a low concentration of dye molecules. Sometimes it's actually on opposite sides of a membrane. But either way, particles diffuse down their concentration gradient passively. That means that there's no necessary energy to put into this movement. Molecules naturally go from high concentration to low concentration. All right, we saw this diagram before, so let's look at it from a different perspective. Before we were looking at it in terms of structure and behavior of what kind of molecules pass through the membrane, but now I want to revisit this with the idea of active versus passive transport in mind. Which of these processes are active and which are passive? So this was a little bit of a trick question because all of these types are passive. All four of these are showing diffusion. They're moving the molecules from an area of high concentration to low concentration. That does that naturally without needing to put in any energy. So all of these are passive transport. So something that influences the rate of diffusion, how quickly particles move, um, is the concentration gradient. See if you can sketch that relationship in a graph. So the higher the concentration gradient, the faster the rate of diffusion. You can think of this like a slide. If there's a big difference between the top and the bottom, it's going to be a quick slide. If it's not a very big difference, it's going to be a slower slide. So the bigger the difference between the concentrations of one area and another, the faster the rate of diffusion. Okay, let's take a look at this diagram and see what you can figure out here. So number one, what's going on? But number two, why am I showing this to you right now? So what you're seeing is, and you can look at the title again, is sodium potassium pump. So in that first diagram, we get some information. We, we get some context. We see the um, membrane, that bilayer, um, and then a protein in the middle. All right, so we've got the phospholipid bilayer and the protein in the middle. And then on the top, it says extracellular fluid. So this is the area outside of the membrane. And it says cytoplasm underneath that. That's inside of the cell. Now, in brackets, it's showing sodium and potassium ions. Those brackets mean concentration. So what this is telling you is that the concentration of sodium is high outside of the cell and low inside of the cell. Potassium is low outside of the cell, and the concentration of potassium is high on the inside of the cell. Now, naturally, these would want to reach an equilibrium. They would want to be the same uh, concentration on both sides. So how is it that the cell can keep this difference, this concentration gradient, on the two sides of the membrane? And the answer is a sodium-potassium pump. So you'll notice that's what, what happens here is... Um, Sodium moves into this protein, and then ATP powers the change of conformation of this protein, which then releases sodium to the outside of the cell. Once it's in that sort of outward-facing configuration, potassium can fit into the protein, and then it again changes configuration to open up into the interior of the cell and let the potassium out. So a couple things important to notice here. 
Um, one is which direction are the molecules moving? And the other is this passive or active transport. So those go together, the idea of which way the molecules are moving and whether it's passive or active. You'll notice that both of these molecules are moving against their concentration gradient. So both of the molecules, sodium and potassium ions, are moving from low concentration to high concentration. So they're moving against their concentration gradient. Um, this is not something that's, that they would naturally do. So we need an input of energy, which you can see in that second uh, frame, of ATP. So ATP is going to power this pump and provide the energy. So this is a form of active transport. Here you can just see what's happening in each one of the slides with um, a little bit of a uh, caption on each of those pictures. All right, here we have an even sort of more complicated system because now we have two different types of proteins. We've got one that's called a proton pump and one that's called a sucrose proton cotransporter. So let's look at that word cotransporter and see what is the meaning of the root word co and how does that apply to what's happening here. A follow-up is would you consider a cotransporter to be passive or active? Why? And then finally, what's the meaning of membrane potential? So co means together. So what's happening here is there are two molecules being transported across the membrane together. Those two molecules are protons, which is that H plus ion. Remember H plus hydrogen has just a single proton and a single electron. So if it loses its electron, all that's left is a proton. So that sucrose H plus co-transporter is transporting two molecules, protons and sucrose. Now, which ones of those are going with its concentration gradient and which ones are going against their concentration gradient? Can you tell from the picture? So a clue in the picture is to actually look at the number of molecules on each side of the membrane. So what you can see is the protons have a higher concentration outside of the cell in that blue area, and the sucrose has a higher concentration inside the cell. So if the cell is trying to get sucrose to move in, it has to move against its concentration gradient. In order to make sucrose go against its concentration gradient, it needs the input of energy. But the energy here is not ATP directly. The energy that it's using is that concentration gradient of protons. So the protons are moving down their concentration gradient, and that movement is pulling the sucrose against its concentration gradient into the cell. Now what sets up that concentration gradient in the first place is the proton pump. Here's where we see the use of ATP. So ATP is used as the energy source to actively transport protons from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. That sets up a concentration gradient, which the, um, that concentration gradient is what's powering that co-transporter. So some people kind of disagree about whether a co-transporter is technically passive or active. Sometimes it's called um, secondary, uh, secondary active transport because it requires energy from the proton pump, but the co-transporter itself doesn't use ATP. Um, so as long as you understand the sort of overall concept here, um, I'm less concerned about whether you call that active or, tra or, or active or passive as long as you understand the whole concept. All right, finally, what is the meaning of membrane potential? So membrane potential is the kind of difference in charge from one side of the um, from one side to the other. So we can see that with the little pluses on the outside in the blue area of the cell and little minuses on the inside. So the relative charge on the outside versus the inside is the membrane potential. And that's showing that it's relatively more positive on the outside and relatively more negative on the inside. And that's due to the action of that proton pump, which is pumping those positively charged um, ions, those positively charged protons, out of the cell. So here's just a summary of what I said. So energy from ATP is used to actively transport proton ions creating a concentration gradient across the membrane. The concentration gradient of H plus ions powers the movement of sucrose against its concentration gradient, and the membrane potential is the difference in charge or voltage across a membrane due to the distribution of ions, in this case those protons.
All right, this is the ma last major concept of this video. This is bulk transport. So let's take a look at these two diagrams. So we have our, our diagram on the top and our diagram at the bottom. Sort of compare and contrast those. What's happening in each diagram? And then let's see if we can figure out what these processes are named. And a hint is that the name very much corresponds to what's happening. And then finally, do they require energy? So bulk transport is the movement of large molecules. So the similarity the, of what's happening is we have movement of molecules um, coming into or out of the cell. If you notice on the top diagram, we have the molecules coming into the cell. That's called endocytosis. Endo is within, and the cyto means cell. So this is the process of molecules moving into the cell. Exocytosis is where you have those vesicles filled with molecules starting on the inside, and then they connect with the membrane and release out, outside of the cell, extracellularly. So exo meaning out, and again cyto meaning cell. So here we have the molecules exiting the cell. This, um, this movement of large molecules, or bulk transport, is an active process, so this does require an input of energy. Let's look in a little bit more detail at both endo and exocytosis. So let's look first at endocytosis, and you remember that endo is coming in. So there are three types of endocytosis. Phagocytosis, which is kind of, it means eating. So we have um, a large molecule, like a food vacuole or a food molecule, being encapsulated by the membrane and brought inside. Pinocytosis um, refers to sort of drinking, and so these are smaller molecules that are captured um, in some of the extracellular fluid, and then that whole vesicle, um, fluid and molecules, are brought inside. The last one is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. So I want you to look at this diagram and think about what's the advantage of receptor-mediated endocytosis. So if you compare the diagram of pinocytosis and receptor-mediated endocytosis, you might notice that um, there are not as many purple molecules floating around as there are green ones. And now in pinocytosis, when those molecules are brought in, it's in the same ratio of green to purple as is present just in the extracellular fluid. So it's just like we take a big scoop of whatever is in that extracellular fluid, and that's what we bring inside. Receptor-mediated endocytosis, you can be more specific. So if we're trying to get those purple molecules, the receptors fit those purple molecules, which means when we're bringing them in, we can get a higher ratio of those purple molecules, which is what we're after, compared to um, other molecules. So it sort of improves the efficiency of the target molecule. All right, now let's talk about exocytosis. And remember, this is where molecules leave the cell. And to talk about exocytosis, let's do a little bit review of organelles. So here we have a picture of a cell um, and a bunch of the organelles that are involved in the process of exocytosis. So see how many of these organelles you can remember, and also think about what is their role in exocytosis. So here we see all of the organelles that are involved in exocytosis. So let's imagine we're talking about a protein that needs to be released into the extracellular environment, that the cell needs to make this protein and then release it. So we start with the nucleus, which is where the DNA is stored. That nucleus, or the DNA there, is transcribed into RNA, into messenger RNA, which then travels outside of the nucleus and is translated into a protein. Remember that translation starts happening in the ribosome. Um, it might start in the cytoplasm, so at a free ribosome. But if that protein needs to eventually be released, there's probably going to be a tag on the very beginning of that protein, so a code in that mRNA um, that indicates that it's going to eventually need to be released, so the protein should actually be finished being made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So that ribosome moves over and attaches to the rough endoplasmic reticulum where protein translation finishes. Um, and then we have the four steps of protein folding. Remember the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels of protein folding to get that polypeptide chain in its final structure as a protein. 
Um, we then move that protein from the rough endoplasmic reticulum through a vesicle, and it connects to the Golgi apparatus. Now, the Golgi is great at kind of finishing the processing of molecules, of proteins or whatever else, what other kind of molecule we're talking about. And so sometimes the processing requires specialized enzymes and might require specialized environments. So it can be in a sort of series of different environments within that Golgi as it moves from layer to layer in order to finish that processing. Um, it can also have um, sort of tags put on it of um, special signaling molecules and special identifiers so that it can end up in the right spot uh, in the organism. So as it moves through the Golgi apparatus, eventually after it's finished processing, it'll go into a vesicle, which then moves to the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, where it binds with the cell membrane and then can be released. And now we have the protein that can uh, leave the cell and go to where it's needed. That's our last slide of this video covering uh, AP Biology uh, Unit 2, Sections 2.6 and 2.7.